Hey guys, this week's Dialogue Options is a slightly different format. It is a recorded phone call that I did with Rex Connor, who is an HR specialist who has worked with 50 different companies, some pretty big, as he'll mention in the interview. But I talked to him about merit-based hiring practices and diversity in the workforce. And his answers were very, very interesting. So I wanted to share them with you. However, the quality of the call is a cell phone at the other end. And so make sure you've got a decent pair of uh, headphones or speakers while you're listening to this and hopefully in a quiet place because there is some background noise at the end. Despite this, hope you enjoy. I found it very interesting. Let's start off right away and plug your book. Like that's what you're here to talk about. So tell me about the book and why you decided to write it. Well, I've been in over 50 companies in my role as a consultant, or I like to say trusted partner. And the, my background in a training methodology written by Dr. Robert Mager um, just gives me a lot of insight into processes in the workplace. And being in, in those companies and using his methodology in training, it made me realize, even outside training, that what he teaches applies to not only training, but any other time a human is performing in the workplace. And I don't know if you remember the end of that book a few years ago called First Break All the Rules. Mm -hmm. That uh, the line from there that applies to this is where they say people join companies, but then they leave their boss. Mm -hmm. And I, I found the secret sauce. I found out what, why that happens. And so now I want to tell everyone why it happened. Now, so that's the purpose for writing the book. Obvious question is, why does that happen? But I imagine that's a fairly multi-part, complicated answer. So... Well, I, hopefully I can simplify it for you. Now, you, you talk about how to determine whether someone is a good fit for the company. And in, in my industry, the tech industry, that is a major point of debate right now. There's a lot of focus on the concept of merit. And you separate merit into two types of skills, prerequisite skills and the skills that can be learned on the job. So you can, can you talk a little bit about how to separate those two types of skills? You know, it, it's as simple as it sounds. If you list all the skills required for someone to perform their job and you just look and you take out the first group are the skills in which you are going to train the people. You have a training program for it, so when they're hired on, they go through the training program. You don't need to hire those skills. The skills you need to hire are the ones in which you aren't going to train them, but they need them on the job, or they need them to learn the skills they're going to learn in training. Those now, are the prerequisite skills. Now, do you find Those are that the ones you want to hire? Do you find that employers tend to think? people need too many prerequisite skills or is the other way around they're missing critical skills that they're not listing on the job posting oh well, you're good at this Leanna <laughs> it's actually both <laughs> interesting because people because people on the job posting they aren't thinking in terms of skills or specific skills really so they haven't identified adequately prerequisite skills nor do they pay attention to, you know, they really don't need these skills. We say they need programming skills, but we're going to teach them our own brand of programming, so they really don't need those skills. They just need the skills prerequisite to that to allow them to learn a new way of programming. Well, you just confirmed something I thought about the tech industry, which is people are overvaluing outdated experience because things change so much. Right. And if you're going to train them anyway, this is true in, in the instructional design world also. We're going to teach them our own brand of instructional design, but we say they need three years of instructional design. Right. Why? <laughs> We're going to teach them our own brand. Well, you're also forcing somebody to unlearn a lot that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, I think in some cases it's better to 
hire someone that doesn't have that experience if you're going to teach them in the only way anyway. Now, how do you feel about education pedigree? If an employer has a resume with a lot of hard on-the-job experience versus somebody who's gone to a top school, how does an employer set those two resumes side by side and, and figure out who to interview and then who to hire? Well, you ignore both. Okay. You identify the skills that this job requires, and you go through the process we already said. Take off the list of skills in which you're going to train them, and if they can demonstrate the prerequisite skills, you really don't care where they got them. Now, you're turning the entire hiring process on its ear here, Rex. That's not the way it normally goes. <laughs> you know, my friend at Intuit um, said exactly the same thing. He yeah. said head. You're turning it on its head. Yeah. I mean... Uh, I was working with him, trying to, uh, um, coaching him on this process. They said, this is not the way it's done anywhere. I said, well, no. that's true, but is this common sense is the question. Well, that's the problem. It's very common sense, and I think companies tend to outthink themselves in this regard. Would you agree? They're so worried about making a mistake that they go for the person that looks good on paper in terms of other people vouching for them instead of looking at what they've actually done and what that actually means in real terms. Would you agree? Yes, because it's easy to say, well, on paper, he, looked, he or she looked good. Right, because other but people said they're good. Cares. Who cares? We aren't looking. We aren't looking to look good after the fact. We want to line a person up with the skills required by the job, so they don't end up being a fish trying to climb a tree. That's a great metaphor. Now, I love that quote from Albert Einstein. Yeah, that is great. Now, we in tech have a pipeline problem that people who are not, you know, the 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 faces you see. In technologies, that's an, indel that's an indirect way of saying basically white 20-something men. People, uh, you know, who don't fit that profile say, we're not getting the opportunities, we're not in the networks. Meanwhile, the companies are saying, we're not getting the applications. We're not getting the applicants. We can't hire people that don't apply. Does this disconnect sound familiar to you? Yes, it does. I think that's very common. And what can be done about it? I, I hate to keep being the same drum to different questions, but really when you, when you become objective and see everything I'm saying is about taking subjectivity out of the hiring process. Now, when you're completely objective, it doesn't see the gender, it doesn't see the color, it doesn't see preferences. It sees someone with skills required to do that specific job. You don't care who that person is, what their background is, how they got the skills, what gender they are, what their sexual preference is, you don't care. A lot of people believe they don't care, but that's not the same as actually not seeing these, you know, unconscious bias. What can people do to make sure they're not hiring for the wrong reasons? Well, if the hiring process is completely objective, in other words, if you have a list and you say, if you have these skills and you can demonstrate these skills to us, you qualify for the job. Now the only people that get through your screening are people that are qualified for the job regardless of who they are. The problem you face is when everyone knows there's subjectivity in the system, so in the back room you suspect, well, they didn't hire me because I'm a woman. They didn't hire me because... I'm an old guy. They didn't hire me, you know, for all these different mm -hmm. reasons because you've allowed subjectivity in the system. So you have to be committed to making the entire process objective now, and do you, transparent. Do you believe this is primarily a structural problem? in companies that they're using old methods based on, you know, those things everybody does, education and, and work experience and references. Do, do you think that the, the process is actually the problem as opposed to the people doing the hiring? Definitely. It's definitely the process. You know, it's a great quote from Edwards Deming. He was the father of the quality movement that we still have, fortunately, but started back in the whatever it was, 70s or 80s. Mm -hmm. ADC said, a bad process will beat a good person every time. 
It's so true. In other words, doesn't matter how good the people are, if the systems and the processes are bad, the result's bad. No, let's... That's what we're talking about here, so you said it very well. Now let's talk about active versus passive recruiting. If you want to find the right people, do you actually have to go out and look for them? Well, you have to attract them some way, but there again, you want it, you want the criteria to be objective. Right. Now if, if it's people internal, you really care where they come from. You may, for other reasons, care, well, we need people from outside the company for this because we can't afford people to be jumping jobs inside the company. Mm -hmm. I think that's lame, but <laughs> I'm just trying to think of a scenario where you, where you might care where they come from. Right. But if you don't care where they come from and you can get candidates that can demonstrate that they're qualified, then get those people wherever you can. Now, how much does personality type or that sort of corporate culture that you hear about so much really matter? Is that a real thing or is that a failure of management when a, a team lacks cohesion? Oh, Leanna, this is a subject near and dear to me. Oh. Um, I, I think it matters a lot. I think fit matters a lot and, and in my whole here I am talking about all this objectivity. Now I'm saying, well, culturally, you need to fit in the culture, or the culture needs to be accepting. You know, it can go either way. And here's, here's how I reconcile those two seemingly opposing um, perspectives. Cultural fit can be identified and translated into observable performances. Do you fit on a team? Soft skills. Do you have communication skills? Do you have management skills? All of those factors can be translated into observable performances. And now when they are, an observable performance is just like a hard skill. It's not a soft skill anymore because we can all observe it and there's got to be little room for subjectivity there. So outcomes-based uh, merit judging. Yeah, if you say, for example, Okay, they need to fit in the culture. I would say, if I'm helping you develop the job description, I'd say, fair enough, Leanna. When you observe someone fitting into the culture, what are you observing them do? Right. And you can list, make a list as long as the list goes, of observable performances that quantify all these soft skills or all these intangibles you can actually quantify them and make them observable performances, make them like a hard skill. Now, how do you ac accurately judge that in these team-based workplaces? So you put three people on a project. It fails. Now what? How do you assign individual blame? Do you make it collectively accountable? Is it a combination of both? What do you do as a manager? That's impossible if you're saying now what and it's after the fact. Okay. Going into it, you, have to, you had to have defined the measurement parameters objectively. So, uh, expectations. It goes in the same process. Yeah. Okay, here's how we're going to measure the success of this project. And I do this a lot as a consultant. That's what I want all of my clients to do. Not all of them do it. Really? You know how it is with consultants. You, you suspect that they're just going to grab your arm and look on your watch and tell you what time it is, is the analogy I use there. Right. You know, where you think, well, I could have done that for myself. So I want my client to be able to objectively measure my contribution. We all want that as employees. We want our contribution to be objectively measured. We don't want a measurement that's, well, my boss doesn't like me or my boss does like me. We want it to be objective. I want that. We want that for any project. How's it going to be measured? How do you establish that? We want an objective measurement going into the project. So then if it fails, we can all see it and we all know. None of us are surprised. All of us know who had that part. You know, what your part was, what your expectations were, because you established them objectively going into it. Ah, so you're saying don't just throw a pile of work at, at a group and say work it out. Actually establish who's going to do what from the outset. Well, you, yeah, you have to do that for a project plan. So many places don't, though. <laughs> so 
so many, so many do not. It boggles my mind. Having been in over 50 companies over the last 15 years, it boggles my mind in corporate America how often we aren't interested in measuring. It's so we true. Pay lip service, but now when it's time to establish those metrics, it takes some work. It's not easy. It's not easy making them objective. And a lot of companies don't want to do it. Well, it's a lot of work off the top before a single thing is produced. And I personally like that part of the process, but I find a lot of people are very resistant to that you know, pre-production stage for whatever reason. Is that something that can be trained for people to become more comfortable with? Definitely. It definitely can. But I'll tell you what's working against you, and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> That's okay. We're gamers. We like that stuff. Okay. <laughs> what's working against you is, well, unfortunately, the metaphor is poop. Okay. Power over other people. Say that again? Power over other people. Okay. There are some managers or leaders that like to give subjective um, standards, expectations, so they can come back later and manipulate it how they want because it's open to interpretation. Because then they're in control. Exactly. Right. Wow. And how common is, I know you can't put a hard number on this, but... Is, is the, Do you see a lot of this? Oh, I can put a hard number on it because 73% of all statistics are made up, including that one. <laughs> I'd say 68% of the time. <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah. But I think all of us can look around in our own workplace and um, we know who the people are, especially leaders, that like the subjectivity, that don't want to be pinned down to specific standards. Mm -hmm. I think we all can see that, that this is common sense. It's a common experience. Well, we can go to working under objective guidelines, objective rules, objective measurements. It benefits. Sorry, my dog agreed with you there. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just. Cats are into poop, so yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they smell their own poop. They eat their own poop sometimes. I'm still talking about dogs, not past managers. I. As you're talking, I'm thinking about my own experiences in various um, media companies. And the things you're saying are all big reasons why I decided to go into business for myself. Because I, I was very successful in terms of objective outcomes. And it seemed the better I did at some companies, the more uncomfortable certain managers got because they couldn't figure out why these projects were succeeding. Does this sound familiar to you at all? Doesn't it, doesn't it sound familiar to all your readers? <laughs> well, that... that In common sense. You know what? I'd, I'd have to start talking to people about that. Perhaps that's a, a hidden part. Do you think that some managers are threatened by sort of that... Um, Instead of feeling like, hey, I'm a great manager, my employees are doing great, people treat uh, successful, you know employees as potential replacements? Yeah, I think it's just they don't think in the terms you and I are talking about right now. Huh. So that's that doesn't make them good or bad. People just, we just accept that things are a certain way and that a supervisor should make objective, eva subjective evaluations because that's the way it is. We don't, we don't even consider the idea, even though it's common sense, we don't consider the idea that they could, if the work processes were all objective, they don't need to make a subjective evaluation. Right. And that that really that alleviates the source of most conflict in the workplace. If the work processes are objective, so no one has the grounds to disagree over what should be done, what the outcome should be, how it should be evaluated, it takes away all of that negativity that comes from the disagreement. That's very Especially true. Especially the big processes, like how you pay people, yeah. how they get recognized, how they get promoted. Think of all those processes were objective. Think of all the negative energy that would not take place in the workplace. Now, how do you... The other way and make it more positive. How do you 
stay objective when it comes to something like negotiating a salary because that's one of the things you hear women don't negotiate in the workplace and so it means we make less money than men now one would think that this would not be a thing if your objectivity principles were applied so what are your thoughts on that well you hit the nail on the head why do you have to negotiate why isn't why doesn't the salary directly relate to the contribution that your position gives to the bottom line of the company I think the obvious answer is because companies want to pay people as little as possible and people go low because they want the job. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they do. And that's a reality you can deal with. But if it's objectively laid out, right. if it says this, this is your work, these are the objectives you have to achieve in this position, and this company is willing to pay this amount if you achieve them, then it's just a matter of, okay, am I willing to accept that amount or not? Again, so... If it's that objective, it doesn't see if you're a man or a woman or it doesn't see anything. It's just an objective standard and you can decide whether to accept it or not. So you're not a supporter of this, uh, it seems, very common modern workplace thing of when you apply for a job, you have to offer up what you think you should be paid for it. Oh, no, not at all. Really? Because that's very common. I mean, every job I've applied for in the last year has asked me to do that and I hate it. Yeah, I have, um, I run a small business and I use independent contractors a lot and I offer the contract. I say this is how much this position with these skills pays and some people say, well, I want to make more than that. Sorry, this, this contract doesn't pay that much. Yeah, I mean, as a business you know, owner. It's more than they're used to making. To me, it doesn't matter. It's this job, this client will pay this much. I can afford to pay you this much. That's right. We call it. You know, one of my good clients is Southwest Airlines, and they have transparency. So I borrowed from that. I call it transparent fees. Transparent so fees, yeah. My company clients, my independent contractors, everyone knows how much everyone's making and what everything's worth. There's no, uh, it's just all out there. See, that's counter to modern business practices, too, that you don't, you're, you know, you sign NDAs that you're not supposed to tell your coworkers what you're making. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I understand the reasoning behind that is because they're going to suspect subjective evaluations and they don't want to deal with that negative energy. It does cause conflict, but it's the subjectivity that's causing the conflict. That makes absolute sense. Now, I think we've kind of answered a lot of the retention issue. But there was a study that right. came out a couple weeks back that female engineers are burning out at an alarmingly rapid rate. It's five to eight years on the job, I believe, on average. So obviously there's a retention problem. And it's not just the case with um, women in tech. Guys are burning out too. So how does an employer prevent that employee burnout? Because I would think it would be cheaper in the long run to keep an employee than to have to hire a new one. Yeah, that's good. You know, retention, um, you mentioned the factors, and really in every industry, you want to retain the good people. And as you suspected, you know my answer already. Mm -hmm. make, make the entire workplace, all of the work processes, see, I want to emphasize work processes. People will never be objective. We don't want people to be objective. We want them to be emotional, subjective creatures. And since we are, and since that's not going to change, the work processes, what the outcome should be, how to do it, how you get evaluated, how you get paid, how you get recognized, those need to be objective. Because you're going to have these emotional creatures. And the first hint they have that they're being treated unfairly, that's going to cause a negative energy. It's going to manifest itself however it does. They're going to leave. They're going to fight. They're going to quit. They're going to not produce as much. Take the potential source of all of that negative energy away. Make your processes objective. And people will stay longer, contribute more, enjoy the workplace more, enjoy relationships more. 
Now, this sounds all very practical to me, but I work in an industry where people pride themselves on logic, and the perception is that you're supposed to, you know, pack down your feelings, repress them. They don't matter. Obviously, you disagree, so I'm hoping you can make a better case than I've probably been doing as to why emotions are an important contributor in the workplace. Because you need people to make exceptions to your objective processes. Because life is like that. Right. And so someone needs, someone needs to have the responsibility to make exceptions. And humans, in order to perform at their peak, and I'm, I'm relying on Dr. Robert Mager now, who's kind of a guru in the field of human performance in the workplace, mm -hmm. people need to be accountable to other people. I run my own business, but I'm accountable to people that work for me for several parts, right. for every part of the business that I have to do, because I know I need to be accountable. Right. Even though it's more convenient to be the all-knowing, overseeing, not accountable boss, that's not human performance reality. Right. So we need people, we need the emotional beings, we need the creativity. We just need processes that honor that and allow that. Now, this is all, I'm sure people are already thinking and applying what you're saying, but I just to close, how do you feel about this argument that some types of people, whether it be, you know, insert the, the, the box here, whether it be women aren't interested in this kind of work or, you know, a certain minority group isn't interested in this kind of work. Do you believe that is a real thing, or is this the um, the communication to this type of person is not being effective to, because everybody wants a job. I mean, people aren't going to say, I'd rather not work than work in X field. So is this a communication breakdown? Do you think it's true that sort of this group identity would override individual interest? What's going on with this, this truism I hear over and over and over again? My reaction to that is nothing overrides. Group identity does not override individual um, decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, any individual can make a decision, but there are things that are typical to a particular group. And my only case is... Let people make whatever decisions they want. Let's just make the decision very clear for them and, and deal with the reality. You know, if millennials leave the workforce more often than other people, if we want to retain them, let's speak their language and get them what they want. If we don't care, if we just want to bash millennials, let them leave. <laughs> but if we want to focus on business, and if our concern is retention, let's listen to whomever the group is and then get it down on an individual level and make sure our processes are so clear that everyone can make their own decision, whether it's to stay or to leave or to you know, be paid this amount. Let's not leave it open to interpretation. Now, how do you facilitate that feedback process? Do you bring people in for chats? Do you do research, focus groups? How is this achieved? I would prefer, I, I don't think there's wrong, anything wrong with any of those methods. Okay. I prefer to let the business realities determine that and build the processes around business realities. Right. You know, I could, I could bring in a focus group that says, well, we all want to make $100 an hour. My business reality does not allow that. Right. No matter how many focus groups say that. And so if I can demonstrate very clearly the, the business and human realities in my business, why the processes are what they are, people can make their decisions. They don't have to question me. I love it when people that work for me, whether it's an independent contractor or I have a few employees, that's high praise to me where they say, well, there's, you know, this is all transparent. I can decide whether I want to or not. I have a value, uh, a good employee leaving me because of business realities. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was high praise. And I said, well, you gave me every opportunity. This is perfectly clear. You know, I'm just not a fit here. There's no hard feelings, our friendships in place because everything was objective. Right. 
he never he never suspected that I'm trying to get rid of him or um, I had a hidden agenda. That's very interesting. All right, Rex, I think I've intrigued people about your book enough. What if common sense was common practice in business by Rex Connor, HR guru? Rex, thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much, Leon. I appreciate the conversation. Oh, 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 oh,